So I'm going to start. So um, I'd just like to say welcome to everyone for our, our latest Tea Time Talk. I'm Ashley Percival Bawley. I'm one of the trustees for the Combined Military Service Museum. And I am so excited for this talk today because we've got Andrew Chatterton here. He is talking about Britain's secret defences. And we all know we are obsessed. We're fascinated about Britain's secret war. And he's going to specifically talk to us about civilian spies, saboteurs and assassins. So it all sounds like all of my favourite subjects really, because I love the SOE, I love spies, I love assassins, I love it all. It's all so exciting. So um, I'm so excited today. Thank you so much, Andrew, for joining us. I'm just going to, there's a couple of extra people to admit, so I'll just admit you guys. Welcome. Welcome. Um, and Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we can't wait to hear your talk. The museum's so happy to, to have you on board and to host this. Um, it, it really is um, such such so wonderful work to have you if i could just ask if everyone can make sure that you're muted and your videos are off um so we can just see andrew's wonderful face as he's giving <laughs> us as he's giving us this wonderful lecture i'm so excited um by the end of the lecture guys um you are free to ask questions please put the questions in the chat and i will ask them for you um and we will have about 15 minutes at the end for questions um andrew if you've got any questions absolutely over to you please take it away Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, really appreciate it on a, on a lovely day. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, Britain's secret defences. I'm going to be focusing mainly on the auxiliary units, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in, in more depth as we go on. Um, so, let me get. So, I, I think we have a, um, a perception of of Britain uh, in, in 1940 or the early parts of the war, um, certainly by uh, after Dunkirk, where um, uh, there's a perception that it's basically Dad's army, that, that, that our defences were built around Captain Mannering and, and, and Corporal Jones. And, and that frankly uh, isn't, isn't the case. Um, and uh, actually Britain had been preparing uh, resistance forces and had been thinking about uh, the impact of a German invasion uh, for, for a long time, even, even in the pre-war. Um, and this pre-war uh, preparation involved kind of two bodies, which I'll talk about very briefly now before we go into the auxiliary units, because they were instrumental in, in helping set up uh, auxiliary units. Um, so one, one group was the uh, Military Intelligence Research. Um, this was formed by the, uh, by the military in the late 1930s, specifically to help um, set up resistance groups in Europe. So those countries, mainly surrounding Nazi Germany, that were under threat uh, of invasion, uh, MIR um, went there and helped to set up kind of prototype resistance forces, started to discuss with the Poles, the Czechs, um, the, the uh, countries in Scandinavia, uh, just what they could put in place if the Germans did invade. Unfortunately, it all came a bit too late. The Germans moved uh, very, very quickly. And so a lot of the stuff that these guys were discussing was never really fully put in place. Um, but, it, but it kind of shows immediately that, that Britain wasn't on the back foot when it came to this, this area, that actually they were, they were really be quite proactive, even if it was a bit too late. And the other part of, of the kind of inspiration behind the auxiliary units comes from uh, SIS, so MI6. Um, uh, they had formed in 1938 uh, a group called Section D, and this was specifically to find alternative ways of fighting an enemy and really Nazi Germany. So that included everything from kind of sabotage and resistance groups right through to kind of propaganda and, and fake news and other clandestine, clandestine operations. And again, Section D was very active, very proactive in going out to these countries and, and helping them to, to build up defences to take part in uh propaganda campaigns they were um putting uh fake news as, as we call it now into into german newspapers um trying to disrupt the the nazi nazi party's propaganda um so there was a lot of there was a lot of thinking and a lot more thinking than than perhaps we give um potentially the chamberlain government uh credit for in terms of uh actually uh starting to think about how we how we go against the the, the nazi regime and, and the potential of them invading um but as I said, that all came a bit too late, uh, potentially because because much of the many of the countries that the, we were talking to uh, were, were quickly overrun, um, and it soon became apparent that actually, rather than helping 
uh, other countries with their with their resistance plans or their potential resistance resistance plans is actually Britain uh, that needed that they need to start thinking about it because because they were literally Germans were literally across the channel. And so the origins of the auxiliary units are really uh, from two places that I've explained. Um, and and this guy had a huge role. A uh, Lawrence Grand um, had held, helped set up uh, Section D. He was a uh, in SIS uh, with, a, with a with a chap called Viscount Bearstead. Uh, and there were two elements of, um, of, of, of Section D, as I was mentioning, the sabotage and then the uh, kind of uh, propaganda and uh, intelligence side. And when it became really apparent that actually uh, it was Britain that needed help, Section D uh, kind of uh, pivoted and, and turned, uh, came up with the Home Defence Scheme, uh, which was what they were advising other countries to do, but just in this country. Um, and so uh, Grand uh, went around uh, and recruited, um, mainly in the kind of southeastern corner, south coast, uh, groups of civilians uh, who he li liberally uh, armed with, with uh, surprising amounts of, of, of arms and explosives. Um, he was uh, planting explosives on bridges, in dockyards, without telling anyone. Uh, he was leaving caches of weapons around. There was no real training of civilians. It was just literally handing them as much equipment uh, as possible to cause as much damage as possible if the Germans had, had come in. And, and, and he did all of this uh, off his own back. And he was, he was, he was quite the maverick. Uh, as you can imagine, when the authorities got to learn about Grand's activities, they were pr pretty horrified. Uh, so, so Ironside, who was, uh, who was uh, in uh, GHQ Home Forces, uh, was apparently absolutely fuming uh, that uh, pretty poorly trained, if trained at all, civilians had got their hands on uh, explosives uh, and, and weapons. Uh, MI5, so obviously uh, uh, MI6's uh, brother, uh, when their agents found out that Lawrence Grand of, of MI6 was left caches of weapons all over the place, uh, again, they were horrified. Uh, they didn't know where these caches were. The police didn't know where these caches were, and frankly, Grand didn't know where they were because he'd, he'd buried quite a lot and, 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 and had forgotten. But the principle is, uh, he was proactive in his in his approach. He was um, he understood the effectiveness or the potential effectiveness of of, of civilian uh, saboteurs and guerrilla fighters, and the impact that it could have on an invading army. Uh, there was another side to uh, home defence scheme, which was the uh, an intelligence gathering side. Um, which uh, later went on to be, a, uh, be form uh, the special duties branch, which I, I don't think we'll get time to talk about today, but uh, it was, he was hugely influential in, in, in the beginning of these, of these highly secret groups. Uh, and that's the other point, because he was SIS, uh, everyone involved uh, signed the Official Secrets Act. So, um, so, so, so told no one of, of what they were asked to do or, 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 or what they were prepared to do. And again, added to the slight confusion about the large number of weapons and explosives still being left uh, all over the country. On the other side, uh, in, we have the, the, the military role. Uh, so uh, Lieutenant, General, Lieutenant General Andrew Thorne uh, was commanding 12 Corps in that kind of Kent, Sussex, uh, Surrey area. So right in the corner, the most vulnerable part of the, of the county of, of the country potentially for, for, for invasion. But it was during his time in, in, in Berlin as uh, the military attache um, in Germany that he uh, learned of the German peasantry militia. So these German peasants had been around since the kind of 17th century, uh, had caches of weapons left uh, hidden uh, in, in, in the forest. And if a foreign invader entered their Lord's land, uh, they could grab these weapons and take on a, a, a much bigger force because they had the advantage of local knowledge, they had the advantage of, of, of knowing where these weapons were and the best points of um, interception and things like that. He thought this was a really good idea. And when Eden went down to visit him uh, at 12 Corps, uh, Thorne had a good old moan about the lack of tanks and the lack of anti-tank guns. But he also brought up the fact that, you know, what about if we brought civilians into, into our resistance plans? Uh, talked about this German peasantry militia idea. Uh, Eden went away uh, and before Thorne knew it, he was uh, having lunch with Churchill, who obviously loved the idea because this is, you know, right up Churchill Street. Um, absolutely perfect uh, for, 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 for Churchill, who'd obviously seen 
uh, the effectiveness of, of, of the Boers uh, during the Boer War in terms of their guerrilla guerrilla fighting, in terms of um, disrupting transport, in terms of disrupting the supplies, even, you know, he got caught uh, on a train, I think, by them and, and, and taken prisoner. So Andrew Thorne uh, was given permission. Um, he works with uh, Colonel Joe Holland at uh, Military Intelligence Research to start thinking about and put in place kind of prototype units, civilian units, uh, that might act as patrols uh, had, the, had the Germans invaded. And they had the perfect chap in mind uh, to, to, to help begin these kind of prototypes. And that's this guy here, Peter Fleming, who's the, the brother of, of Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond, but uh, just a fascinating chap uh, in, his, in his own right. Uh, before the war, he was a uh, explorer. He'd been to the jungles of Brazil. He'd been in China. He'd actually been helping military intelligence research um, in China, helping the Chinese uh, with new ways of fighting the, the, the Japanese. Um, and he'd, he, was, he was brought back after the um, Norwegian campaign. He was part of the independent companies um, and was brought in to, to start these prototype patrols. He uh, uh, worked out of a, uh, a place called the Garth in Kent and he started to recruit kind of very similar people. So, so farmers, gamekeepers, uh, farm workers, estate workers, anyone who had a really in-depth knowledge of their local surroundings could probably handle a weapon as well. Um, and he started to bring them in and train them as, as kind of guerrilla fighters. Again, they all signed the Official Secrets Act. They began the process of thinking about how these units would act. Um, and they decided actually they couldn't really go out, carry out uh, an assassin or an assassination or, or, or a piece of sabotage and then return home and so they started to think about underground bases and what that might look like and how they how they might operate out of those they dug some rudimentary underground hides as they called them um, and he also sought to prove the effectiveness of these of these units um, by essentially um, blowing up stuff in in uh, in uh, general's uh, headquarters so one example is that he and uh, Mike Calvert uh, who was in this as well uh, went at night to General Montgomery's uh, headquarters, planted uh, time pencil explosives in the flower pots, uh, went away, came back in the morning, told Montgomery uh, what they'd achieved. Uh, Montgomery was just in the uh, flow of denying that such an attack could have happened because his guards were, were so, uh, so on it and there's no way that could have happened when the flower pots shattered uh, outside of his outside of his window uh, and presumably shattered his his belief in his guards but also brought to his attention uh, for the first time the the effectiveness of, of, of such a of such a force so with these two groups with hds with um with 12 core observation Corps, which is the the group that peter fleming had uh, set up uh, working in tandem uh they decided uh, it was a, uh, an idea that had real legs that could be really effective in helping uh, Britain's defences. Um, but the military were determined that uh, Lawrence Grand wasn't going to play much of a part in this. Um, and they wanted to bring it under military control and away from, uh, away from the intelligence services. So they brought HDS uh, and the civilians uh, that they'd already been recruited under the wing uh, of uh, Colonel Colin McVean Gubbins. Uh, another remarkable chap. Uh, he was a gunner in the First World War, uh, but it was during the kind of interwar period that he gained a real understanding and um, uh, a real passion for guerrilla warfare. He'd fought in the um, uh, in the Allied uh, intervention during the during the Russian Revolution alongside Ironside. Uh, he'd fought in Ireland against the IRA. He'd fought in uh, in India. Would been part of in in, in India. He had uh, he'd been leading the independent companies, uh, the first kind of commando units uh, in, in, in Norway during the Norwegian campaign in, in 1940. So it was the perfect chap really to take these prototype civilian organizations and it extend, uh, extend them the, the length of the country to, to uh, the vulnerable counties. So kind of the, the east coast of Scotland, the east coast of, of, of England, that southeast corner, south coast, southwest, and then South Wales. There was nothing really on the west side. They didn't see initially the threat from Ireland as the, as the biggest one um, and just kind of covered the east side kind of coastal counties. Um, a question we get asked quite a lot is why were they called the auxiliary units? And it's, you know, essentially because it's such a bland um, 
bland term it doesn't it doesn't refer to anything uh, if the germans had overheard or a spy had overheard someone talking about the auxiliary units it doesn't immediately uh mean that they're they're civilian saboteurs and and assassins so so it's just a, a bland uh group that could be written down on paperwork without necessarily immediately giving the game away so gubbins uh had the uh job of extending these these potential uh, patrols the length of the country uh, and he did so by uh, recruiting intelligence officers. Initially, there were about 12 of them uh, to, to, to 12 uh, main counties, uh, each of which they had an affiliation with. So they're either born there or grew up there or part of the county regiment. Um, they were given a car, a driver and essentially a free hand in setting up patrols in their county where they thought they, it could be most effective. Um, again, they all had to sign the Official Secrets Act. And they had deep local knowledge, which means they could go to a go to a, uh, an area, decide that uh, a particular area had good targets. So it might be along a main road, it might be near a railway track, it might have, be near a um, uh, a big uh, country house, which might be taken as a German headquarters. And there they would they would um, try and find uh, try and form these patrols. They um, most of these intelligence officers were also had fought in the independent companies um, alongside Gubbins and, and Fleming and, and, and those guys and so had a, a good idea and a good inkling as to the types of men that could be really effective in these roles and could understand the effectiveness of guerrilla warfare and, 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 and how, to, how to undertake it. So once the intelligence officer had uh, reached his county uh, he would then go and, as I said, select an area which had good targets or good potential to have to be a base for, for, for one of these patrols. He would then look for a patrol leader. So the patrol leader is usually, again, someone like a farmer, a, a gamekeeper, a landowner sometimes, someone with some authority, uh, a mine, miner, for example, up in, in South Wales in the northeast, uh, someone with some authority um, and someone who could uh, quite easily pick six to eight men uh, to join to join their great join their join their patrol and the the patrol leader again was given a real free hand in in this he could basically choose who he wanted to um but because of the nature of the auxiliary units and the level of secrecy surrounding it they usually chose trusted sources so family friends colleagues sometimes foes uh, so we've got examples of gamekeepers um recruiting poachers because the gamekeepers knew damn well uh, that the poachers knew the land as well as they did. They could certainly live off the land and were pretty good at, at, at uh, keeping out of the way of, of, of authorities and, and probably could, could set booby traps as well. So it's all those types of people, people really familiar with the land, could move across fields at night, uh, could, uh, could, could very easily move around without getting caught. Uh, as I said, patrols are generally six to eight men, um, usually led by a sergeant, uh, so that would be the, the patrol leader he would become a sergeant there's usually a corporal and then and then a few and a few privates involved but again they were generally made up of, of, of friends family and, and colleagues or, or friends of friends to keep that kind of circle of trust equally the level of secrecy meant that as patrols were being set up they had no idea really where their where where the other patrols were or who was in them um, they had they had very little idea we've got examples where we know now that uh, from one operational base, you can see the sites of another operational base, but at the time they, they, they had no idea. Uh, we've got examples of brothers in neighboring patrols, uh, not realizing one, that they were both in the auxiliary units uh, until the kind of early 2000s, uh, even though they were in patrols next to each other. Um, and, and the secrecy goes as far as we've got an example of a son being recruited into the Yorkshire units in about 19, late 1941, um, who replacing someone what he didn't know was the person he was replacing was his father who he lived with and his father uh, didn't know that his son was replacing them and again they didn't didn't talk about it uh, at all uh, the father died in the in the 1960s 1970s and his son didn't find out that he'd replaced his father in the unit until again until the early 2000s so the level of secrecy within each patrol and then as patrols across the country they uh, was was really 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 high So what was their role uh, once, once the Germans had, had, had come? So as soon as the Germans entered their particular area, they would disappear. They would, they would go to their, um, to their underground bunkers, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, and they would, having signed the Official Secrets Act, no one would know where they've gone. So they would have 
their families and friends would, would have no idea, their wives, children uh, would, would have no idea, they would just simply have disappeared. Um, they would also have then at that point no further outside contact from any source. Um, they were so highly trained, which again we'll talk about shortly, uh, that they, uh, they could be trusted in terms of um, targeting uh, the, the, the right areas, in terms of finding targets to hit each night. And they were absolutely told they had to go out each night and find a target. They could not have a night off um, because, uh, and we'll talk about it just in a bit, their life expectancy was so short, they had to make literally every night count to do some kind of disruption. So their role would be uh, to stay in their bunker during the day and then come out at night. And from there, cause as much chaos as, pro uh, as possible. This isn't about defending nodal points. This isn't about taking on the German army face to face, head on. This is about causing as much chaos as possible to the, to the supply chain, essentially. Uh, you would let the spearhead go over the top of you, sometimes literally, and then come out at night and, and really try and impact the invading army's ability to keep their frontline troops supplied with weapons, with food, with fuel, with reinforcements, uh, to, to, do, to really have a massive impact on morale. So that would include the assassination of, of, of high-ranking German officers. That would include the destruction of uh, aircraft and airfields, of, of railways, of railway bridges, of convoys, of, of, uh, of trucks, of, um, of, as I said, uh, of country houses that would have been taken by, by Germans as, as headquarters. Anything that would slow down that would advance. Um, so, you know, what they didn't want to happen was, the, as, as happened in France and the Low Country with the Blitzkrieg, they wanted to make sure that they, the Germans had to pause. And that would give our regular forces then the chance to take a step back, to gather themselves and to counterattack more effectively. Um, it's, uh, and this they would have done, uh, they would have carried this out with utter, utter ruthlessness uh, in, in the execution of, of, of their role. Um, and again, this kind of goes against our perception of, of Britain at, at, at this time, um, that, uh, that we aren't playing uh, cricket with a straight bat. This isn't about, uh, this isn't about traditional Br British um, morals. This is dirty, dirty fighting. And this goes to the extent that, that each patrol uh, had a sealed list or in their minds, uh, civilian targets or targets they would have to take out immediately uh, following the Germans uh, entry into their into their local area. So that might be uh, the local policeman who would have to check their backgrounds to allow them to join the auxiliary units. He wouldn't have known they were joining the auxiliary units, but would have seen this group of men's names together. Uh, it might have been the intelligence officer who we talked about earlier, who knew where every patrol was, who was in each patrol and where each of their underground bunkers were. The intelligence officer would certainly have been high up on, on at least one of the patrol's assassination list. It would have been any British civilian seemed to be collaborating uh, with the Germans. Um, it would have been anyone who was asking too many questions, anyone who had accidentally found their, um, uh, their underground bunker. It was utterly, utterly, utterly ruthless. And when you, there's not many left now, obviously, but when you spoke to these guys over the years, they weren't uh, proud of the fact that they were that they would have done this, but they were pretty certain that had had the balloon gone up, they would have been utterly, utterly ruthless to be effective. And then this goes back to the fact they had such a short amount of time to be effective. So anything that had the potential to to to, to reduce the amount of time they had to be effective, they would they would absolutely have, have, have shut it down immediately. And as a result of that, uh, their life expectancy was was a fortnight at maximum. They had a fortnight's rations, um, but essentially they, they knew that they had a very restricted amount of time before they were either caught um, or before they were, before they were uh, killed during, during one of the missions. And again, the ruthlessness goes, goes back to that. If a uh, patrol member was injured on the way back from a mission, the rest of the patrol were, were obligated to, to assassinate their own member or to at least give him the uh, the weapons and the means to take him take himself out as as well as as well as some Germans uh, if if need be uh, because again that would have reduced the amount of because captured and tortured he might have given away the the location of their operational base and that would have reduced the amount of time they would have been effective. So 
in order to be effective, these guys had to had to have weapons, uh, and they had they had lots of weapons. Gubbin's relationship with Ironside uh, from his time in Russia and over the years um, meant that they were they were given huge amounts of weapons very very quickly. Um, he had to send two weekly reports, Gubbins, during during the early part of 90, uh, summer of 1940. Uh, one to Ironside and one to Churchill, updating them both on the on the progress that the auxiliary units were making. And Churchill wrote um, on one of these on one of these updates: these all of these men must have revolvers. So every single member of the auxiliary units were given a Smith and Wesson, something like that, some kind of some kind of revolver. Uh, at a time when the Home Guard were struggling to get any weapons at all, uh, they were they were given the Thompson submachine gun before most. Uh, uh, certainly before the Home Guard and before most uh, regular units as well, um, and they were given huge access to that, mainly because of the priority that Churchill uh, and, and Ironside saw for, for these guys, but also the relationship that, that, that Gubbins had with them as well. Um, it's not just uh, uh, revolvers and Thompson submachine guns, they also had sniper rifles for one, uh, living off the land, but also two, for, for, for taking out some of these uh, civilian uh, snipers as well. They also had, uh, as you might expect, a vast amount of explosives, a huge amount of explosives to be effective in, in, their, in their sabotage missions. Um, and we've got a really good example of just how much they were given uh, by uh, a record we've got of uh, a chap called Reg Sinnett, who was a group commander in Essex. Uh, and these, he in the 1960s phoned up the police and said, uh, I've got one or two bits uh, that you might want to come and collect from the war. Um, I was expecting the army to come and collect them at the end of the war, but they never came. So it's 20 years later. Can you come and have a look around? And when the police arrived at his house, uh, Reg explained that these were just the spares, the spare bits uh, that the, he, he hadn't handed out to the patrols. Uh, so uh, just very quickly, I will take you through the list of the spares. Right. So this is 14,738 rounds of ammunition. 1,205 pounds of explosives, 3,742 feet of delayed action fusing, 930 feet of safety fuse, 144 time pencils, 1,207 long delay switches, 1,272 detonators, 719 booby trap switches, 314 paraffin bombs, 131 fog signals, 121 smoke bombs, 36 slabs of gun cotton, 33 time pencils and booby traps uh, switches attached and, and made up to charges. So a, a huge amount, a huge amount of explosives. That was his spares uh, for the for the five patrols that he he commanded, um, and and they were they were allowed to train. Um, they tried to find places like quarries. Uh, and anywhere that was out the way where they could train with explosives because obviously they needed to know how to handle them. Um, uh, and, they, and they were given a huge amount uh, there. You can see in the picture there, just some of the kind of pull switches and time switches, uh, the, 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 railway, uh, the railway device there as well, um, but a huge amount of explosives, uh, which, which most of them had quite a lot of fun uh, dealing with, but it was hugely dangerous as well. Uh, we've got lots of examples of guys losing hands, um, and obviously, if you're in a secret organisation that the authorities don't really know about, uh, we've, uh, if you lost a hand or indeed were killed uh, during training, it's really hard uh, to gain any kind of compensation or, for, or to get a pension for, for, for your widow. Uh, so all of these things, the weapons, explosives, uh, were really, really important. But actually, the most effective weapons for, for the auxiliary units were those that would allow them to get to the target, to get to the thing they needed to blow up. So, so uh, Fairbairn Sykes knife, truncheons, um, commando knives, anything that could uh, that allow them to get in and out silently were, were their preferred methods. There's an example of a patrol in Cornwall who uh, sent all their guns back. Uh, so all the guns they were sent, they sent them all back because they were just gonna use uh, silent weapons. And they were trained in, in stalking, they were trained in, in how to uh, get to a sentry, take it, take his, uh, slit his throat, stab him in the kidneys, uh, leave his body in a mutilated fashion to to scare the living daylights out of out of his comrades. And you have to remember, from a from a, an invading army perspective, the they would have been coming out at night. Um, these the the Germans would have very little idea where they were. Um, they would be 
uh, on sentry duty around an airfield and suddenly groups of uh, men would just come up, slit their throat, leave their body mutilated, destroy the aircraft and get out. And that is pretty scary for any group. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the Germans would definitely have considered them kind of, kind of terrorist groups. So, so it, it's uh, these are, and you can see from the picture, you know, this is a really dirty fighting again. This is not, this is not your kind of traditional uh, perception of the British army in 1940, 1941, perhaps of kind of set piece battles, but actually dirty, dirty fighting. What I'm saying essentially is it's definitely not dad's army. Um, it's, it's, it's the very opposite of dad's army. Um, it is much more like these guys. So this is a patrol uh, in Hampshire and you can see they're all young. Uh, this isn't dad's army. This isn't Corporal Jones, Captain Mannering. These are guys in reserved occupations, fit farmers, miners, um, estate workers, game, game workers, people who, who generally kind of lived and worked on the land and who would have been called up to the army uh, or the military if, if they weren't in reserved occupation. So, so this is part of our kind of civilian defence that just doesn't get um, talks about enough um, and actually were, were hugely, uh, could have been hugely effective. And you can see here, they're all, they're all really heavily armed. They've all got revolvers. They look like, like uh, commandos um, and, and their level of training kind of, kind of um, proved that as well. Uh, this is another group, this is a group in Dorset um, from Spetsbury. Uh, this is a good group because one, they look absolutely terrifying. And two, you can see in the front there, either side of the patrol leader, two, very clearly two brothers. Um, of, 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 and in fact, I think there's three brothers in this group. So, th you know, this is a good example of, of, of the type of men that were recruited, um, young, fit, determined, but also quite often uh, relatives. So I've talked quite a lot about their underground bases. Um, so I thought I'd go into just a little bit more detail about them. They're the most remarkable structures. Um, initially, they were dug by the men themselves. Um, although, uh, unless you've got an engineer, uh, you know, ensuring that you can breathe underground, quite often proves quite hard. Quite a lot of cases where, where people were, were, were going unconscious and had to be dragged out. And so a little later in kind of late 1940, early 1941, Royal Engineering, uh, Engineer Tulling Group came and um, started uh, to put these operational bases uh, in, 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 in much better designs. There's no standard design, but there's a, there's a kind of common, common, common elements to all of them. Um, essentially, the main chamber is like a big Anderson shelter. Um, there's a, it's, it's obviously all underground. There's a, there's a hatch uh, flush to the ground. Um, which can be opened in a, in a number of ways, either uh, rolling a specific coloured marble down what looked like a rabbit hole down, down into the bunker and the guys inside would know who was there and they could lift up the, lift up the hatch. You'd pull what looked like a tree root uh, that would ring a bell downstairs or it'd automatically bring up the hatch on a kind of counterweight system. Um, once the hatch was open, you would go down a ladder uh, into the main chamber. You'd be confronted by a blast wall just in case the Germans had somehow opened the hatch and dropped a grenade down. And then you go into the main chamber, which as I said, is like a big Anderson shelter really with, with bunks uh, and tables uh, in, in, in place uh, to rest during the day and to plan your, your, your next targets during, during the next night. You'd also have, uh, in some cases, a Elson chemical toilet. You'd also, in some cases, have uh, a kitchen, which isn't ideal uh, if you're trying to keep an underground bunker uh, secret because of smell and smoke. So they uh, brought uh, chimneys into hollow trees uh, to so the smoke would disperse at the top of the tree line. Uh, so, so any German patrols walking past would have no idea what was, what was going on in there. Um, there will also be quite often uh, an observation post uh, up to, up to uh, a mile or two away potentially uh, that was linked to the uh, operational base by, by telephone. Um, so you would have one guy sitting in the OP during the during the day, one keeping an eye out for, for the German patrols, and he could give the give the um, the guys in the in the main um, main op operational base the heads up. Also, he he would be looking out for targets as well. So if he sees a a convoy parked up on the side of the road a few miles away, that might be something they go for, or a patrol moving forward or something like that. So so he was he was always there um, to keep an eye on things as well. Uh, I think the best way to show you is really, this is kind of obviously a cutaway picture. You can see on the right hand side there, 
where the hatch would be, the ladder going down into the blast wall, the, the horrific chemical toilet and the kitchen with the chimney coming up, uh, the bunks. And then out the back on the left hand side, you can see a, an escape tunnel. So the escape tunnel gave the, uh, the patrol the opportunity to escape had the Germans discovered the hatch uh, in the main entrance. Uh, it would often lead to a, uh, either a, a steep hill or a water source where to give the patrol the best chance to get away. But really, uh, speaking to these guys, they knew that was really there for morale purposes, nothing more. Some operational bases just didn't bother to dig them because it, it, it wasn't worth it. Um, it. One thing to just say about the engineers who came to dig these uh, operational bases is that they came from counties out, they weren't from the county where they were digging. So, so they wouldn't be I'm in Devon, they wouldn't, a Devon uh, engineer group wouldn't be digging the Devon uh, operational bases just in case the Germans did invade and they could just really easily grab these guys and then they could take them one by one to, to each of these operational bases. So they came from outside or were Canadian sometimes, outside the area, very quickly build these operational bases and then get out again equally as quickly. They tried to dig them within a, within a day or two um, and they would give the excuse uh, to anyone asking that it was a unexploded bomb or they were digging a, a potential um, anti-aircraft area or one example in Kent they say they were they were digging uh, tunnels to put spare food in uh, just in case the in case the Germans came and that seemed to have put off quite a quite a few of the of, of any uh, curious um, civilians to start with. Um, this is a good, ex well, it's an example of, a, of, of one that's uh, of an operational base that's intact, obviously, uh, that's up in Scotland. You can see the bunks there on the left hand side still in place. You can see through the doorway there, uh, the water tank that would have provided them with, with, with fresh water. Most of the operational bases that we find now are, uh, are, are collapsed. Um, you can see uh, that this kind of corrugated elephant iron um, that, that is obviously rusting through now because we're 80 years on. Um, but you can still see uh, in, in a lot of cases kind of the brickwork or the shape at least. Uh, but occasionally we find beauties like this um, still intact, still with, with lots of stuff inside. So in terms of specific targets that patrols would go after, we kind of talked about this quite a lot. Um, but it's all about it's all about the uh, about not as I said not taking on the frontline units. This is about taking on the supply chain. It's about taking on uh, areas that's going to have a real impact on the ability of the invading army to carry on at the same speed as they're as as, as they've been as they've been going throughout. I'm gonna run up about now. So very quickly, training uh, training took place at a place called Coleshill House, which is near. Uh, High Worth, a market town which is near Swindon. Uh, unfortunately, it burnt down after the war, but there's still lots to see there. Uh, it's a National Trust property, um, so it is open to the, to, to the public. Uh, patrols were invited, one or two members of patrols were invited to, to come and attend. Um, there, uh, they would get, just get a letter and they would say, uh, when you get to High Worth, go to High Worth Post Office and say, uh, we, you want two stamps. Uh, so they go in and there they would meet uh, Mabel Stranks, the postmistress, um, you, you'd say your code word, she would go out the back, phone up Coles Hill House, who would then send a truck round uh, to pick you up, uh, they would drive a convoluted way back, so you would have no idea where you were, and once there, uh, you had had everything you need to, 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 to practice for your role, so they had uh, German plane, German tanks, where you could find uh, the best places to place explosives on, you would have firing ranges, they did lots of night exercises, um, they had demonstration operational bases, uh, they showed you how to disguise your routes to and from the operational base, and they, they obviously taught silent killing, everything like that. So it was a, that was their training and uh, training and where and the headquarters of the of the auxiliary units as well. But also there was local training in place. So they were in each county, there are one or two what they called scout sections. So scout sections were patrols of six to eight men made up of regular soldiers who were there one to train the uh, other uh, civilian patrols but also to act as a patrol had the germans germans came um and they were uh, that's where a lot of the training took place uh, was was in and around the local area with, with with these scout sections a lot of these scout sections were would would later go on or the members of these scout sections would later go on join the sas um directly and some of the civilians did as well such was the the level of training that these guys got um that they were perfect for kind of those SAS roles um, 
uh, later on in the war. Um, just very quickly on this, this is something that I talk about in, in the book that's out in July. Um, there were also the Home Guard themselves, which, which uh, you know, definitely get uh, um, portrayed as this kind of dad's army. They had uh, their own um, guerrilla sections in many cases, not in the areas where the auxiliary units were, but in more, more inland it tended to be. They had secret, um, they had secret guerrilla sections that, that would have acted very similarly uh, to the auxiliary units. We've got letters from auxiliary unit officers moaning about the fact that the Home Guard was trying to start, set up their own uh, guerrilla sections and that, that was stamped down pretty quickly. But equally, there were the Home Guard had all kinds of secret areas where they, uh, for example, the Home Guard factory battalions, they had a subsection of, of each battalion who were secretly told they were to dismantle critical parts of the factory had the Germans come into their area. Uh, interestingly, not destroy it, uh, but just to dismantle it, place it somewhere else. Uh, so when the British counterattacked, uh, they could put it back in place. And again, the same with petrol stations. So this is all the things that are learned from the Blitzkrieg. When the Germans came through their panzers, they literally stopped at French petrol stations and filled up and carried on. So that speed uh, would, would, you know, kept going because they, they, there was nothing stopping them. So what they wanted to do was they would dismantle petrol stations as well, uh, take the parts away, hide them, bury them. And when the British counterattacked, put them back in place so the British tanks could fill up and carry on. I haven't got a lot of time to, to speak about this in, in much detail, but but the Home Guard themselves were, had had would have played a really, really important role, as well as kind of guarding those nodal points. There's lots of secret stuff happening behind behind the behind the back as well. So when it came to, to towards the end of the war and the, the threat of invasion massively diminished, they changed their role changed uh, the auxiliary units, they changed to kind of anti-raiding roles, so they, they got uh, they were there prepared for, for any German raids, particularly during the, the, the run up to, to D-Day. They, um, they guarded uh, patrols in Scotland and Northumbria, uh, guarded uh, the royal family at Balmoral when they were there. The Queen used to call them the fighting farmers. Uh, and we're trying to get in touch with the Queen to see if she has any memories of them. We've got a great photo of them all at, all at Balmoral. And uh, patrols from all over the country went to guard uh, the Isle of Wight um, during during the D-Day landings in case of, of counterattack, and that's really inter interesting. Not only did the Isle of Wight have obviously have their own home guard, there were quite a few patrols, auxiliary unit patrols on the island, but they also supplemented that um, because there was a twenty four seven guard on the Isle of Wight. So patrols from Dorset, from Essex, even up uh, in, in in Yorkshire were coming down to to, to guard the the Isle of Wight. In no, it wasn't until November 1944 that um, that the Yorks units were, were stood down. Um, they had basically been run down since since D-Day, and as I mentioned, the scout sections, the regular and the scout sections, went away and, and tended to join you know, special forces. Um, quite a few of the civilians went and joined special forces as well, and unfortunately, a few of those guys uh, lost their lives in in occupied Europe. Um, and the explosives uh, and operational bases were meant to have been um, uh, collected and, 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 and got rid of. But on the whole, the nature of a uh, highly secret force with highly secret underground bunkers is that, is that they're not very high, they're, they're, very, they're hard, to, hard to find. So the explosives weren't collected uh, on the whole. Uh, farmers used them to uh, blow up the trees that got in the way of, um, of the ploughing. We've got great stories. Um, in, there's one in South Wales where um, during VE Day the uh, celebratory uh, bonfire wasn't didn't didn't wasn't lighting because of wet wood. Uh, so one of the Orcs unit guys went uh, grabbed some of the phosphorus bombs um, that he had hidden, uh, lobbed them on to great effect uh, to the extent that the road started melting. People were chucking water on to try and put it out. Obviously that didn't help. That just made things worse. Uh, so eventually he did what a lot of uh, patrol members did, and he uh, chucked them over a bridge into a, into a river. Um, so uh, lot, yeah, lots of stories of VE Day of, of great big explosions um, uh, during the celebrations, and that is essentially the Orcs units using up uh, all, all of their leftover explosives. Um, the only thing, the only recognition they got was this very, very small lapel badge. Um, the numbers on there are for when uh, later on the war uh, they were given um, uh, battalion numbers, um, so 201, 202 and 203, 
uh, represent the north of England, uh, the, the kind of east coast and south Wales, and then and then the southwest and south coast. Um, but, but this is all they got. And this is usually a sign that relatives have, the only sign that the relatives have, that, that, that one of their relatives was involved. This is of, of sometimes in, 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 in the belongings of, of their granddad or, the, or their father. But unless you know what it is, it doesn't, it doesn't really show much. They also got a, uh, a stand down letter, uh, which essentially says, and I don't know if you can read it, essentially says, uh, thanks for your work chaps, you're not getting any public recognition. Uh, you, need to, you need to remain uh, absolutely uh, silent about your role during the war. And I'd say 75, 80% did. They went to the graves without telling anyone. We're still telling relatives now that their father was, uh, wasn't just in the home guard, which they used as a cover, but was actually a, a really highly trained um, saboteur and assassin. Um, but they, they were, and they're of that generation, if they signed the Official Secrets Act, then they will absolutely go to the grave um, without, without, without telling anyone. And, 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 you know, fair play to them, they did. But unfortunately, from our perspective, we got to speak to so few of them um, it, 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 it is such a shame that they never got really the public recognition that they deserved and they're, you know, you know, it, that all goes to help with this portrayal of Britain at this time of being kind of weak and just with old men with pitchforks on cliffs, but it was absolutely not that. And the, and the Orcs units is, is just one element, um, of, 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 of Britain's defences. Um, I, I briefly mentioned the uh, special duties branch and there's the, the secrecy of the, of the home guard units as well. But actually we, we, we need to take a, we have this weird pride in, in Britain, I, I feel in this time of being, um, of being underprepared, of being, um, of being armed with pitchforks of old men trying to do their best against, against, against panzers. Actually, I think we should have a new pride in actually how prepared we were in the resources that we threw at this, in the training that these guys had, in the utter ruthlessness that they would have carried out their missions had the Germans come. I think that's the pride we should have. And that's the reality of, of, of the situation. Uh, I don't know what time we're on. Is that, is that good for now? Are we good for questions? Hi, Andrew. Hey. That was amazing. I had to take a moment to pause and reflect <laughs> uh, about how much information and fantastic stories that you just gave us. Really, absolutely incredible. Yes. Really That's incredible. Good. I have to say, there are so many comments with, we've got some fantastic questions. Um, everyone's uh, really wonderful, wonderful comments for everyone. I'd just like to say, when you said, um, aren't playing cricket with a straight bat, that I think is the perfect analogy for Britain's secret war uh, and our <laughs> clandestine operations, because we really did do that in all the different type of sections that we had. There was just this sort of undermining and completely relinquishing of taboos. And yeah. I think that's, um, yeah, I loved that. I thought that was a fantastic analogy for, for sort of our clandestine um warfare it was really really good now we've got some really great questions um so i'll just flick all the way to the top of our chat because oh my goodness people thank you so much what wonderful wonderful, wonderful question guys so um there's a question here which i think is quite interesting so did monty so field marshal montgomery use the idea at all within any of the tactics he used in the field i think this is quite interesting um because obviously guerrilla warfare it's um an unconventional force meeting a conventional force so it's asymmetric warfare essentially um so can we learn from that and i think that's a really relevant question for the time and the warfare we live in now can we learn from me being a conventional armed force because we still are really as a british army now um and then we're looking at conflicts like ukraine and russia can we take can we take lessons from there and can we utilize them in a, a different type of armed force yeah i'm sure look i i think you know some of the tactics being used by the ukrainians um for example are exactly what the orcs units would have done and i'm sure monty took some of the lessons that he learned um and 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 and, and yeah definitely use them in in, in, the, in the desert war and then in mainland europe especially when you're coming up against a uh, you know after d-day and the, and the move through normandy and the move through france into Germany where you're going to be coming up against 
really hardcore resistance um, that that some of the, you know learning what these guys were, were capable of I think probably stood them in, in, in good stead in those in those areas for sure. Oh wow that's fantastic and we've got another question um, and I think it's quite interesting because I, I, I've, I've sort of read different uh, opinions on this uh, so it says though Churchill supported the auxiliary units was there any dissent either from in parliament or at a senior level within the forces because I do know some of the secret services didn't like each other so like the SI yeah, and I think like SOE and things like that. Yeah, I mean, there's a yeah, there's a few there's a few examples of that. So there's the example of when the military started to gain more control over the auxiliary units, uh, they started to try and bring them into regular service. So give them proper uniforms, give them insignia, give them square bashing rather than rather than um, you know kicking people in the nuts and stabbing them in the kidneys. That you know that that they they definitely tried that. And equally, it's kind of um, shown in the home guards the home guards passion and determination to have um guerrilla forces themselves and that was parliament and mps were were desperate for the for that not to happen because they would have you know essentially been shot out of hand um as 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 terrorists so you know the facts uh the auxiliary units were kept under the radar so much that most of most of parliament didn't know about them but certainly when the home guard were asking for the same thing they they, they absolutely stopped it and shut it down immediately oh that's fascinating because obviously churchill was very um his butcher and bolt um boys for the royal marines he was quite, quite proud of that sort of yeah um, he he as you can effort. imagine he absolutely lapsed up the, the auction units yeah. um it's absolutely it's bang on for him loved it very, very Churchill. Um, yeah. I've got another really interesting one. Um, given this is from Nicola, given this was from a rural network to cover um, that part of the invasion, was there any complementary setup for seaside towns or more urban areas? And I do think that's interesting because we do, um, there are different doctrines you, where you have FIWA fighting in woods and forests, and, and you have FIBUA fighting in built up areas. So did they have different types of doctrine that they'd follow? So so yes, so as you know, as you say, the, the auxiliary units tended to be in coastal counties, but away from that immediate uh, coastline. Um, there's two county exceptions to that in terms of Worcestershire and Herefordshire, which were much more inland. But uh, in terms of industrial areas and more urban areas, particularly in the Midlands, in the Northwest, um, there are, and we definitely won't have time to talk about this, there are post-occupation civilian groups in place um, very similar roles, except for there were no women in the auxiliary units. Women in this post-occupation defence set up by SIS were trained in grotting uh, German officers and trained in explosives, trained in. So that was a uh, that was a after the British had been defeated militarily, SIS would have pushed the civilians into action as as a post-occupation uh, defensive force. So yes, absolutely. As the Germans went through each area, as they went through each coastal area, they'd been attacked by the Yorkshire units. As they went more inland and they took over more ground, they would have been attacked then by the post occupation guys as well. Oh, that's absolutely fascinating to see the flexibility of thought and remember yeah. having that, being able to be that dynamic to deal with that invading force is, I think, is really important. Yeah, and um, it's just, just not something you, you uh, it's just not something you can even link with 1940 Britain, in, you know. The perception is of these you know granddads walking around with with spears but actually it was and you know and you can see pillboxes and stop lines and things like that but actually there was so much more under the cover that, that, that people just don't know about that's fascinating and why did they the, why did they kind of make that decision to bring as, as a women's historian and a historian of war i get really excited about the, the question of women in war and why why did they bring make that decision to bring women in after the invading force when soe had already decided that they were going to use women and parachute them into europe yeah it's interesting so the military arms so obviously the auction units were under military but uh section seven this this uh post-occupation was obviously intelligence services and they were much more likely to, to to bring in women in a in a in a combat role um basically in a post-occupation role women could walk around more freely than men uh women could women could still still need to go out and, you know in the roles in those days they still need to go and do the shopping they could they could attract german officers into the woods and they could be they could be garroted so actually intelligence service saw real value in, in using women and actually in the special duties branch this other group which is a which is a, a anti-invasion group of spies and wireless operators 
they utilize women massively there because again you didn't want a 34 year old farmer standing on the street watching the germans go past because they'd been caught up immediately if it's an old if it's an elderly woman or, or a mother or a doctor or a vicar or a vet someone who could just stand there in plain sight they would absolutely have, have used those so so special duties branch originated again with sis and then the military took it over but they kept women as a core part of, of that group as well oh no, that's wonderful um i've had another question um from roger so um roger said three questions but i'll ask one so we can get just a couple more questions in so uh roger asked how were they trained without their family noticing yeah that's that's a good question it's a really good question so we get <laughs> lots there's lots of examples of where wives were absolutely sure their husbands were having affairs uh because they kept disappearing the weekend um they use the home guard as a cover. So they would say they were part of some kind of special home guard unit uh, or that they were uh, um, or, or they were in a or kind of alternative home guard. And that would give them the excuse to, to go away to Coles Hill for a weekend or to go away each week, uh, each night to, to, to go and do more training. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I, the, the, lots of families were, were put under real strain <laughs> during, during this period because men were just get, disappearing left, right and centre. Oh, no, no, that's fascinating. And and you do see in some of the films as well, I mean, um, there's uh, some of the sort of classic uh, spy films and from the Second World War, there's a, oh, but I'm a driver or that, um, oh, I work, I work in, I, I'm a clerk. And there's these sort of ambiguous excuses that you can make. Well, I go somewhere every day. I can have sort of an ambiguous job and no questions are asked because of the yeah. sort of the propaganda at the time and the don't ask questions, you know, um, information can take, take lives um so that probably that sort of i think you're right i think that yeah there's, there's not all that propaganda going around i think they're of that generation where they probably didn't ask too many questions anyway but but yeah they had they had a few excuses under their belts but yeah so certainly there's we've spoken to five or six wives who are pretty sure their husbands were having affairs but they were just blowing up stuff in the woods instead well it's a good cover <laughs> it's yeah. a good cover isn't it <laughs> Um, so I've got one last question, um, and uh, it's from DT again. It says, I'm sure some of these men may have been abused for not being on the front line. So again, that sort of, um, you're a coward, um, you know, the white the white feather, you know, how did they deal with that? Was it being able to say, no, I, I do work for the war effort. I do something for the war, war effort. But again, that ambiguous job, being able to yeah. that cover. Yeah, uh, quite, a f quite a few of them got white feathers. Um, and not necessarily because they weren't joining the regular army because they were in reserved occupations anyway and people kind of yeah. stood that you know a farmer or a miner or you know what it had to be had to be at home what they got white feathers for were they they weren't part of the home guard they weren't taking part in the sunday uh sunday parade um they uh you know had all these old guys joining up but actually you're you know you're a young farmer why aren't you joining but they you know they literally couldn't say anything so yeah quite a few of them got white feathers a guy who's still alive down in Cornwall who got who got a white feather wow. and uh, but but he just had to take it he'd signed the official secrets act couldn't say anything um so yeah and didn't and didn't say anything most of them didn't say anything until till the you know the the early 2000s um and we you know when we got permission for them to march past the cenotaph for example a guy uh, about seven or eight years ago a guy in uh in south wales only told his family because the day before the march passed because he needed a lift to london right so this is the, this is the, this is like the oh. level of we're talking about that the families have no idea no idea that their, their family members were, were, were involved as we were talking about before most of them are gone now um so we're telling relatives unfortunately that you know it's too late but here's what your dad would have done oh that's absolutely amazing um, so we've come to the end of our talk. What amazing um, questions as well. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone um, for coming. And um, please, absolutely, Andrew, if you'd like to mention your book. Yeah, so it's uh, Britain's Secret Offences, um, Civilian Saboteurs, Spies and Assassins, which is out July 15th. All things being fantastic. Well. Um, I will be getting a copy. So <laughs> if you fancy signing it for me, please pop it into the museum and we can have a proper good old chat about it. That'd be amazing. Yeah, um, but everyone else, please absolutely um, get Andy's book. It's just it's, it's going to be remarkable. It's going to be so good. What an amazing amount of information, wonderful research. And please do, if you're in the area, come and see us at the Combined Military Services Museum. Um, we've got so many interesting artifacts that helps tell the story of, of our secret war in Britain and in Europe. Um, so I will...